Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to my colleague, uh, Mr. Carper, um, nobody is more focused on a bipartisan solution than you. I get that. I will say that uh, the experiment in Massachusetts was what they wanted to do, and with a lot of flexibility, they were able to put together a plan that works for them. Their costs are also very, very high. Their health care costs are probably some of the highest in the country. Um, but that's how they chose to do it. And I think what has been missing a little bit in this debate is, you know, what this is all about. And it's a very different proposal than the proposals that we have been looking at previously. Uh, this is one reason that Senator Graham and Senator Cassidy have received some heat uh, from conservatives, because it takes the funding in the Affordable Care Act and it sends it back to the states. I mean, and gives the states the flexibility to be able to do what they think is right for their citizens and to be able to more effectively cover low-income citizens in those states. I, I totally agree with what Ms. Miller and Ms. Mann, Democratic you know, witnesses this morning, have said in terms of getting at the underlying costs of health care. I would just suggest that one way you're going to get at the underlying costs of health care is to give the states that flexibility to be able to get at it. And we seem to be sort of talking past each other a little bit, but that's fundamentally what this is about. Yes, there is a change in traditional Medicaid as well. And we can argue about that. I mean, as Senator Graham said earlier, if you don't do something on Medicare and Medicaid, it takes up the entire budget within you know, 30 years. I mean, it's, it, everybody, I think, acknowledges we've got to do something on entitlements, I hope. If not, we've got to figure out uh, an entirely different way to get revenue in this country. But even there, um, again, there's been some criticism from the right saying, you know, this is essentially taking the existing costs and, and continuing them. I mean, if you look at the per capita that means that it increases by population, so the Medicaid traditional Medicaid does change, but it goes up by population. But second, there's an annual adjustment by inflation, and it's at medical inflation and medical inflation plus one. Um, what CBO projects for the rate of growth with regard to, for instance, uh, blind and disabled category under Medicaid is actually slightly less than what these guys are proposing for their per capita program and the annual increase in Medicaid in that category, because it's M and M plus one, 3.7%. So it is actually uh, a proposal that's been a little bit mischaracterized. But let me, let me just talk about why we're here then. I mean, what's the problem? And, and you all hear it uh, because you all have individuals in your states who uh, depend on the individual market, small businesses, families. Uh, I get a email from a guy named Dean. Uh, he's a guy who's lost his job back in 2009. He finally found a plan that worked for him. The Affordable Care Act comes in. He loses his plan. He's now paying, according to Dean, twice as much for a plan that has less benefits for him and higher deductibles. Uh, Mike from Westlake tells me recently our health care insurance rate single employees under 30 went from 198 bucks a month to 560 bucks per month. We just had a small business roundtable on Friday in Ohio. Healthcare costs was obviously a huge topic for them. And no wonder, Joanne from Dublin sends an email saying she feels like she doesn't have healthcare at all because under the Affordable Care Act, her deductible has gone up to $11,000 for a family. We'll never reach that deductible. She says, I don't have healthcare. So here are the numbers from Ohio, and I don't know what your states are like, but we just, a couple weeks ago, published the numbers for 2018. 34% increase. Who can afford that? To these small businesses, what, what's our answer? And so the status quo is not working. And by the way, I agree with what Senator Carper said about the CSRs, these cost-saving reforms to be put in place to help with stabilization. If we do that in Ohio, the insurance companies say it'll be a 23% increase. So it helps, but it's still totally unacceptable. So I guess, I guess to you, Mr. Smith, because you're one of these experts who are dealing with this every day, can you explain how this block grant model would help someone I talked about, like Mike or Joan or other folks in Ohio who are seeing their costs just skyrocket under the Affordable Care Act? Yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, again, uh, <clears throat> I think that the giving the flexibility back to the states, uh, I think we ought to judge what states will do on what they have actually done. And I, again, I would point out CHIP being a very good uh, expression of that, where they had tremendous flexibility 
in defining what the benefit package was, defining cost sharing, et cetera, and states uh, put their uh, efforts into uh, competition uh, in good comprehensive health care uh, and also trying to be as efficient as possible with those. Again, I think that, uh, as I pointed out, the CBO got the insurance pool so vastly wrong because of the subsidized pool turned out to be much smaller and the Medicaid pool turned out to be much larger. <laughs> this proposal puts those pools together and bringing those healthy lives into a larger pool is what is going to help stabilize premiums. Okay, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I look forward to a second round of questions. I'm going to talk more about the formula. So we talked about the theory of getting back. I do continue to have concerns, as you know, uh, Dr. Cassidy, on the formula, and I want to talk to you more about that and how it affects the various states. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.